Today's episode is brought to you by the professionals at Olive Branch Bookkeeping. As a business owner, it's important to stay on top of your finances, but that can be difficult to do on your own. That's where Olive Branch Bookkeeping comes in. They will assist in monitoring income and expenses, allowing you to make decisions that are critical to the success of your business. Don't wait any longer. Reach out to Olive Branch Bookkeeping today by visiting the link in the show notes and start moving your business in the right direction financially. All right, welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Wealthy Entrepreneur Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Silvius, and I'm with my co-host, Carrie Branner. And today, we're going to discuss how to overcome procrastination. Um, but before we get started, I just want to mention, if you're a real estate agent, if you're in the North Idaho, North Idaho or Eastern Washington, Spokane area, um, if you're looking for a space where you can connect with other like-minded entrepreneurs, exchange ideas, collaborate on projects, Uh, I want you guys to check out At The Cove. At The Cove is a cutting-edge real estate co-working space and training center located in the heart of Post Falls, right on the border. And whether you're looking for a private office, shared workspace, At The Cove has a variety of options. So if you are interested or need more more information, reach out to Carrie directly or visit at-thecove.com to learn more. So now we will get into how to overcome procrastination. So Carrie, yes. it's all yes. you. <laughs> I would say this has been like for every single human being, you know, this is a thing as a coach. It's something that we talk about. Andy, you and I have talked to entrepreneurs over time and time again. We both struggle with it, of course, ourselves sometimes too, because we're uh, human beings. Yep. But, you know, there's been a lot of, um, for over the years, you know, I've been coaching entrepreneurs for almost 15 years now. And there's some new neuroscience that has come out um, studies that have done been done that have talked more about why we procrastinate as human beings and what we can do about it. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that today because in the past probably 10 years or so, we have talked about different ways we can overcome procrastination, things that we can do to change our mindset around the tasks that we need to do. But oftentimes we still boil it down a lot of time to, oh, what is your big why? What are your priorities? What are your big rocks? Let's talk about priority management. And then we can actually develop our time strategies around that. And this whole uh, study kind of has taken away the idea of even worrying about priority management or time management when it comes to procrastination, which is really fascinating and really inspiring at the same time, because a lot of entrepreneurs feel like they're doing the best that they can at time management and priority management, and they're still procrastinating. And so if that's the only solution, it isn't super exciting for some. And I think this might give you a little bit of a different thought process around it, which we know everything starts with our thinking and hopefully it'll help somebody. I actually have just started to implement a few of these strategies that we're going to talk about today. And it's quite interesting. And I think we do some of this stuff um, maybe a little bit naturally, but to hear it in the way I heard it from the article I read, and then I did some follow-up research on it because it was so curious to me, made it even easier. So Basically, the idea is this, this, you know, forever struggle with procrastination that's been around forever for all human beings. And of course, it's really detrimental to entrepreneurs and business owners. Um, you know, the, the stuff in our job, we just cannot stand to do the things in our house we don't want to do. And we just let things pile up. We've all been there. We all know that we uh, like to push tasks aside for later whenever we get the chance to and create excuses around that. But the thing is, is that you know, as coaches, people ask us all the time, why am I procrastinating this stuff and how can I make it stop? Because I'm working on my time management, I'm working on my priority management and I'm not, it's still not working. And so yeah. this article specifically said, you might be surprised to know that it's just not simply about better time management. Yay, it's not you guys, it's some other things here. The real reasons are actually embedded deep in our brain. And so this, the neuroscience behind procrastination is that um, it's much more uh, about understanding what procrastination really is and what parts of the brain it comes from. And so they're saying basically it's pointing to self-regulation, not poor time management, but really self-regulation. They're basically saying that it's not the failing of understanding what your priorities or your or, or the time you have allotted for things, but rather an emotional response to something. And so we procrastinate to manage our moods and our feelings. 
And that is so true if you think about it. But whenever we've talked about procrastination, we don't hear that very often. So the way that they described it was the human brain is divided into two parts, the limbic system, which is responsible for our emotional responses, and then the prefrontal cortex, which we talk about in coaching oftentimes, if many of you've had a coach before, they've told you, because that's the part of your brain that's involved in decision making and planning. But when we're Mm -hmm. faced with an uncomfortable task, the limbic system actually is what reacts with discomfort, which actually leads to a desire to avoid the task. And that's a more powerful part of our brain. Then therefore we have procrastination and the prefrontal cortex, the planner is going to be easily overridden. Okay. So if we understand that there's this tug of war happening in our brains, then we can actually start to develop more effective strategies for over- overcoming procrastination. So before I move into some strategies though, Andy, when I said, when I read that word, which was, we're not procrastinating because we don't know how to manage our time. We're procrastinating because we don't know how to regulate our emotions. It was a huge aha for me personally. I don't know if you have any thoughts around that. Yeah. So I, as you were saying that, I I didn't realize it was tied to an emotional response, but I've recognized for myself, the times when I procrastinate the most is when I don't enjoy the task, but something I don't like, then it's one of those things that I will push off and I push off. Um, or when I'm overwhelmed or stressed, it's easy to feel, let's just say you're having a busy day, you know, you have 15 tasks or 15 things you need to get done that are high priority. Yeah. It's, there's times where I don't accomplish any of it. I procrastinate all of it because I'm overwhelmed from this feeling of being stressed. And it's a horrible way to operate. You know, it doesn't happen all the time, but there's times where it's like, yeah. And I got to figure out how to break it down and just do little bits at a time to, to chip away at it. But. Yeah. Well, what's interesting to me about this conversation was what you said, when you're stressed, when you're frustrated, but here's the other time when I coach people where I had this aha, and even for myself is like, I'm procrastinating something like lead generation. Yes. It's uncomfortable. We don't want to be rejected. Those could be the reasons that we're doing it, but there's people who actually have emotional responses that they don't even understand that, that they're having that are tied to, um, an uncomfortable feeling around, well, what happens if I become successful? Um, you know, the fear of success is the number one fear driving fear we found in human beings much over fear of failure or fear of rejection. And so I just think about these things and I think all of these tasks, some of them are just simple tasks. We just plain don't like to do. And so then therefore we have an emotion or a mood, some sort of response to that. But there's some really deep, I think, embedded like feelings and emotions about certain things that we have that we aren't realizing are really overriding it. So no matter what our prefrontal cortex is going to tell us to do to plan our day, that limbic system is going to go, nope, not going to happen because it's an emotion. So that's very interesting to me. So we have to understand that that's actually happening. So when we understand and we're aware that that's happening, now we can actually make some decisions to do something about it. Well, Um, really quick too, I want to ask before you go into that is I've heard this thing about people being afraid of success or, uh, you know, that's this big fear. I've never understood it though. Like, and have you had more of these deeper conversations with people and what is their, what is the fear around being successful? Oh my gosh, it's crazy. Um, The number one fear of being super successful is that you can't maintain that level of success and that you're going to fail further than you would if you just stayed in an appropriate level of success. That seems to be the number one thing is like, if I'm here successful, people know I'm pretty successful and it's cool. If I failed, it really wouldn't be as obvious. It wouldn't be as detrimental. But if my level of success is like way up here, now if I fail, it's going to look horrible. It's going to be devastating, not only to lifestyle, to income, but really quite frankly, to the ego more than anything. And maintaining that level of success is what's actually the scary part, not getting there. Um, But I would also say that there's a lot of people that don't know that they have um, like guilt and shame that's kind of inside of them that have been put on them by other people about wanting to be successful, wanting to make more money, wanting to live a certain lifestyle, wanting to buy a certain size house or whatever it is even if that person gives a lot of their money, but likes some of the finer things or wants to live out on land and have a bigger property and give their kids more than they had. There's a lot of people that feel like their family is kind of rejecting them, thinking differently about them, friends. Um, Like, why do you think you have to have that? We're all fine doing the basic things over here. Um, And really just what is my life going to look like? Am I going to have to find new friends? Am I going to have the same relationships? 
Is it going to affect my personal relationship with my spouse? There are literal people who believe that they could play so much bigger, but it's going to impact their relationship with their spouse until they don't do it. Um, and so, or isn't that weird? It's weird. weird I mean, there's an analogy too, or uh, I don't know if it was a study, it was like crabs or I don't mm -hmm. know if it's crabs or spiders, but it's like, it talks about, let's just say they're crabs, right? And they were in a container and you have a whole bunch of them. If one tries to crawl out, the other ones will actually attack it and pull it back in. And it's yeah. like, I've heard it many times on other podcasts, not something original that you know, I came yeah. up with. It's just, but I hear that and it's like, we do that as people. Yeah, we it's pull people down too. because we are afraid to go to our fullest potential. So then we're going to just rip on people that want to do that for themselves. And again, a lot of this is a subconscious behavior from both parties. Like yeah. people aren't necessarily trying to drag their family members down. Maybe some are, but I think in general, people aren't trying or consciously choosing to do that. But it's literally, an, it's a subconscious and egoic response. And, you know, there are people that it's it's completely ego driven, but like, I'm going to make more than my spouse and that's going to create a problem. So I'm just not going to do it. Um, it. You know, really, really interesting thing. So I think that that's where we have all of these emotions playing deep inside of us that we aren't even always fully aware of. And that is actually creating the procrastination. So when we're trying to say to people, just go time manage better in this particular sense with things of procrastination it's probably not going to solve the problem. And that's where a lot of, you know, um, I think deeper conversations in coaching can be very, very valuable so that you can kind of start to see what emotions, whether I know I'm having them or not, are actually keeping me from, you know, doing the things I need to do. And by the way, it could be health. It could be cleaning your house. It could be, I mean, we procrastinate a bunch of things. I have people that procrastinate their financials. I'm sure that your wife deals with that all the time. And that's an emotional response. It's not because they don't have time to manage their finances. It's because there's an emotion that is somehow holding them back from actually getting into action. And that inaction can cause massive problems for them too. So I, I yes. and I know, I know that if I were to self audit things in my life, right, I'm going to find similarities. Like it, yeah. I just can't recognize them while we're sitting here talking, but yeah. um, yes, but it is kind of crazy when you think about it, like we're self-sabotaging ourselves yeah. based on these things. Well, and that's a perfect segue. You're like reading my mind because um, the next part was like, there's this self-reinforcing cycle of procrastination that we have to understand as well, because what we're talking about here actually fits into why we keep doing it. So it's, there's this curious, but like you said, destructive situation that goes unnoticed when we procrastinate, which is basically turning it into a self-reinforcing cycle because the thing about procrastination is that it's immediately rewarding because when we decide to put up a task that we're generally choosing to do something more enjoyable or less stressful at that time, in lieu of that, we're watching TV, we're going through social media, we're even just doing another business task that's less critical or whatever it is. These are pretty much instant gratification things that we're doing. So then we're momentarily alleviating that discomfort and we're immediately rewarding ourselves with the feeling that we accomplish something that makes us feel good, which is a release of dopamine. So this feeling of pleasure is actually going to reimport and reinforce this habit of procrastination, making it even more likely that we're going to continue to procrastinate. And so the catch though, as we all know, is that there are negative consequences of this stress, guilt, poor performance, uh, all the things, making less money, being unhealthy, whatever, but they're all delayed. That's the problem. They don't come to fruition until the deadline or you know, a few months down the road. And then we realize that putting off working out really shouldn't have happened, you know, right. or the quality of our work suffers or all of a sudden we can't pay our bills. And so that's the time gap that makes it harder for our brains to actually link that the act of procrastinating with its negative consequences. So we're not putting it together. Like logically we are, but our brain is not. So when we finally face the task, the stress, the anxiety, all the overwhelm, we have to deal with it in some way, shape or form. But oftentimes if we can, <laughs> we still procrastinate it unless we absolutely can't, then we push through it, but we probably do it in a really shoddy manner and you know, whatever the case may be. So with that though, how do we escape the cycle then what? So we know this now it makes total sense. When I was reading this, I was like, aha after aha, because 
we can't always will our way into doing things because it's not always logical. I think that's what I want to tell people today is this isn't logic we're talking about. This is the actual behaviors and the subconscious things and the links and the neurotransmitters in our brain that we don't actually have control over. We do, but we don't in the moment. And so the first step is that we have to recognize that immediate pleasure of procrastination is fleeting and it's going to lead to more harm than good. So we know it, but we, in the moment have to like bring that to the forefront consciously. Yeah. We need to challenge that belief that the current self, and I love this statement, the current self's enjoyment is worth the future self's stress and anxiety. Like we actually have to say to ourselves right now, being more comfortable or having more fun, is it worth having more stress and anxiety and these problems in the future. And when we pair this understanding with strategies such as do dopamine hacking, which I'm going to talk to next, which helps us actually reward progress, then we can stop that self-reinforcing cycle of procrastination. It's interesting. It's okay. um, yeah. It's okay. like, the, it's like the more you procrastinate, the more you procrastinate. It's crazy. If you think about it that way. Well, I mean, there's a lot of self self fulfilling prophecies that we we do to ourselves, right? I mean, this kind of goes to other conversations we've had about, yeah. you know, failure and the the repeating of cycles because then you reinforce those failures that you can't do certain things, right? So it's yeah. kind of it's the brain, it's, yeah, yeah. So they talked about one of the most effective strategies to combat this is um, our ability to reframe the discomfort that's associated with the task. So. We know that it stems from our emotional reaction. And so what we need to do is we need to change our perception of this discomfort and turn it into a driving force. And so they literally give this action step, you guys, is a phrase that is extremely simple. Is gonna You're going to be like, what? Uh, but the phrase has the power to actually shift our perspective and the internal chemistry of our brain. And I'm going to explain why. But the statement or the phrase is, this is the good work. Write that down. Okay. So if you're doing something that you're going to procrastinate, you say, this is the good work. This is the good work. Okay. And when you encounter a task that feels overwhelming or unappealing, or you're nervous or whatever, and you're going to procrastinate, you pause, you acknowledge the discomfort. So that's, I think is important. You have to acknowledge that you want to procrastinate because you don't want to do it. And I think sometimes we do think that, and then we just move on. But yeah. I mean, like you got to pause, realize you're going to procrastinate. You don't want to, this is the good work. And this is why it works, um, according to uh, psychologists. Number one, it reframes the discomfort in a way, in two, and it, it points out two crucial things to us as human beings. It acknowledges the reality of the situation. I mean, we have to acknowledge the reality. It's not like we're trying to pretend like this isn't going to be challenging or uncomfortable or whatever, but we have to realize it is, but that's okay because right. not all tasks are going to be enjoyable. And the discomfort is a sign that we are pushing our boundaries and we're growing. So we have to acknowledge that and go, that's what we're doing here. It aligns with the task. It aligns the task with like the goals and values that you actually possess as a human being. Yeah. So when you refer to the task as the good work, you remind yourself that this task, even though it's difficult or unenjoyable or whatever, is valuable and meaningful. It's super important to like in the moment connect the dots because what's happening is you're not connecting the dots because you're going through a subconscious pattern and just procrastinating and moving on. So basically we're teaching you in this segment and I'm being taught as I'm, I'm, I'm continuing to learn this, that it's, it's just a conscious, it's a movement from some conscious to conscious, but doing some specific things that can change your brain. But there's also this secondary fascinating, in my opinion, neuroscience angle, which is when you reframe the task in this way, it actually triggers a dopamine release in your brain because you're no longer viewing the task as a threat by the way that causes stress and aversion but instead it's as a challenge and a step okay. closer to your goals and that's actually motivating and rewarding and your brain will will recognize that so over time if you use this phrase then you're going to change the way you respond to challenging tasks because it allows you to basically how are the um, harness that power of dopamine to fuel your motivation rather than feeding into the cycle of procrastination. So the key here though, is consistency Which in every podcast. We've said this word like 12 times, because the more you practice the strategy, according to all of those people that have done that, the more automatic it will become like, you're not even going to think about it anymore. But here's the interesting thing about, um, 
this dopamine is that is what's released every time we procrastinate because we do something that's like, oh, great. I relieved myself of a task I didn't want to do. And I did something more fun. And that's where we're actually, our brain is the one that is therefore motivating or demotivating us. It's not our will. It's not our time management. It's not our calendar. And so we just have to navigate that a little bit. But you're almost becoming addicted to procrastinating. Literally. Yeah. From dopamine. You know, you've read all these articles, you guys, whoever's watching this, we've read it. I know you've read it about dopamine is literally like a drug. It yep. is a drug. I mean, you become addicted to it. And so that's why you have people who like my husband just finished a race and he's like excited to do the next one. It's like, you know, the interesting thing about that is he, the, the training for the, the race is far more interesting to him than actually doing the race. I mean, he does the race. He's like, cool, I did it. But really it's like the anticipation of, and I think he literally says to himself like every day that he goes, cause he doesn't want to train every day, but once he gets started, he's tying it to this challenge that he knows he's going to get to. And by doing that and, and, and saying that to himself, he's like, that's a dopamine release. And it's actually making him more motivated and super excited because he has that goal at the end that these little steps are taking him to, but he has to actually say that to himself and then release the dopamine, like make himself feel that way about it. And then he's going to get addicted to wanting to do more of it instead of procrastinate it. And so strategies yeah. like this is the good work and reframing our discomfort, that's where we really can kind of tap into that inner drive. And that's where people need to understand that you know, it's not willpower and it's not all these hacks outside of ourselves. It really is understanding, I think, the human being and the brain and knowing that we do have total power to move past things that we don't want to do and move into things we want to do. We have the complete power to do it. Yeah. We just have to understand what we're doing and not doing. And I would venture to guess, and I've been helping people with procrastination and myself for years, and I hadn't quite known about it this way. So I think 90% of people think about procrastination in the wrong way. They don't even know exactly why they're doing it. You can't change something that you don't truly understand. Yeah, there's a, a couple of thoughts on what you were just saying. So the what you mentioned about your husband training for the race and, and actually where he gets more excited about the training aspect. Yeah. And I don't want to get too in the weeds here because it might be outside of the topic of what we're discussing, but it's kind of the same way in business. There's a lot of people who run a business who are always looking for the outcome, the yeah. end goal. Oh, eventually I'm going to get to this place. But really, if you learn how to operate in a place or come from a place of under, enjoying the process yeah. of getting there, Yes. How much more enjoyable is your work? How much yeah. more can you accomplish because you enjoy the process of getting to that point instead of always focusing on the end result? Um, and and so I, tra I trap those, myself in that. Yeah. So tying those daily things and that process, the stuff we don't want to do. The productive be, stuff. That, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, to being the thing that moves us forward and is the good work. And so that we're actually getting the dopamine hits all day long when we do these things instead of waiting for the dopamine hit at the end, yep. because very rarely does the end actually get there as a yes. business owner. That's the problem. And that's what I was getting at. It's like, it's, we all kind of, and I do it too. I mean, we all do at certain points, especially when you're new in business, you're always looking at, well, I just need to get to this threshold and then everything's going to be good. And then you get to the threshold and you realize whatever that is, right? When, whether, yeah. whether it's a financial goal, yeah, it doesn't even matter. You have this objective you want to achieve, but when you get there, you realize, okay, nothing's different. It didn't make me feel the way I thought it was going to make me feel when I got there. But if you tied it to the same process that your husband does with training for marathons and you did that every day, how much better would it be to come into work every day? How much more do you accomplish at that point? There's also, I don't, I'm not gonna have time to look it up right now. There is also a scientist who's been on, it's Andrew Huberman. Yeah. He's been on Joe Rogan quite a few times. He actually discusses dopamine levels and why it's, pro, it's productive for us to have high dopamine levels, but in the right areas. Mm -hmm. So he might be someone for anyone listening who's interested in this to check out some of his shows. He has his own podcast discussing mass amounts of actual data behind dopamine and how it, how it helps. So. Yeah. I love it. I mean, I would, uh, yeah, I think this is a great, like maybe we do another segment a little bit deeper into that because there's a lot of additional things that you can do to actually purposefully release dopamine in your brain, which is going to help you get into action and do the things. Yeah. And I think that that is just, this is one thing. Um, but they have found that when people started to actually do this thing, it changed 
a lot for them in their cycle of procrastination. So I wanted to bring it out there to everyone because I am definitely using it and trying it myself. And I find it to be very fascinating. So I think that's what makes the, the, these episodes exciting for me is like, we just, you and I are both talking about things that we are, have experienced or are experiencing or learning about. And we're just trying to share it with everybody who's listening. So, um, yeah. Did you have anything else on that one? Or was that, was that it? it, you guys? Now, you know, you don't have to be perfect at time management to, uh, you know, not be a procrastinator anymore. And I think that in and of itself is quite, uh, I guess, in, inspiring or motivating. So we don't have to feel like, oh my gosh, I'm never going to get this skill and I'm never going to be able to get my things done. It's just simply not true. So although some people still need time management skills. Well, as yeah, well. you need that too, but that isn't <laughs> your only solution. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> if you can do both, you're going to be in a great, great shape. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. Well, thank you guys for listening. Uh, again, just as a reminder, check out our show on all platforms. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We've also got all the audio platforms like Spotify, iTunes. And if you guys have any suggestions on topics uh, that you like, you would like us to cover or discuss, make sure to shoot us a message in the show notes. I'm sorry, in the comments. Mm -hmm. I'm all off today. Or yeah. um, just reach out to us online. Yeah. We'll see you on the next one. See ya.